Thank you so much. You know, it's always a little risky to um, appear with your mother because she knows all the secrets. And um, uh, But actually, I, I have to say that for me today is a very good day because any day that I get to spend with my mother, and even more importantly, I um, get to appear jointly with her addressing such a, a meaningful and important topic as the one we're talking about today is a good day indeed. And before I get into the substance of my remarks, my mother started out referencing our family's strong connection to education and educators. And she neglected to mention that she herself was a teacher. But I remember as a little girl, and I think all the teachers in here will um, probably approve of this, my father served on our local school board. And I was a very little girl at the time, but once a week he would have school board meetings and he had my sister and myself very well trained because we would usually have a family dinner at home before he went off to go to his school board meeting. And then he'd look at us and he'd say, now what's daddy going to go tell the people at this meeting? And we would pound on the table and we'd say, we need more money for the schools. <laughs> and he'd say, that's right. <laughs> and so to this day in all um, you know, the households that have, uh, have derived from Tom and Annette Lantos, you know, the kids around the school table say, we need more money for the schools. So we really do value and honor what you do. And we know you play sort of the critical role in determining the caliber of the next generation of Americans to, to take their place as leaders in our society. My mother is part of a generation that personally experienced one of the darkest chapters in human history. For many years, in fact, for many decades, it seemed that the horrors of the Holocaust were so vast and so terrible that they could never be forgotten and therefore never, ever be repeated. And yet, as we gather on a beautiful summer day on the campus of one of our nation's great universities, the comfortable assurance that many of us used to feel about the impossibility of the Holocaust ever being repeated has become less comfortable and less sure. Mark Twain once said, history doesn't repeat itself but it rhymes. And for many of us, we are deeply disturbed by the all too familiar rhyming couplets we are beginning to hear. In Europe, recent years have seen an alarming resurgence in open anti-Semitism across the very continent that in my own parents' lifetime saw the calculated murder of six million Jews and the attempted annihilation of the entire Jewish race. Let me just briefly mention some of the recent manifestations of this ancient evil in the continent of Europe. In Hungary, my parents' native, native land, in a chilling echo of, of Hungary's fascist past, recently a leader of the far-right Jobbik party publicly called for the compilation of a list of Jewish citizens who he alleged posed a security risk to the nation. In France, not too long ago, there was the shocking shooting of young children at a Jewish day school in Toulouse. And there was the public letter sent recently to a rabbi invoking death camp imagery. Events like these make it easy to understand the results in a recent poll showing that one quarter of the Jews in France feel personally threatened and desperately want to leave the country for their own safety. In Belgium, at a recent UNESCO-listed carnival, men dressed in SS uniforms paraded in a Nazi rail car. And in Turkey, a TV commercial for a shampoo promotes that particular hair product as something worthy of Hitler's use. So Hitler is being used to sell a shampoo product in Turkey. These are pretty disturbing and pretty terrible manifestations. We at the Lantos Foundation are deeply alarmed by these trends. And in keeping with our mission of continuing the legacy of my late father, Congressman Tom Lantos, we have launched the Never Rest campaign. And that echoes the quote my mother um, shared with you at the end of her remarks, that we are the guardians of that thinly veneered civilization and we can never rest. The purpose of our Never Rest campaign is to raise awareness about the rise in anti-Semitism and take steps to confront and combat it. 
One of the key initiatives that we will be undertaking is a major conference on this topic that we will be co-sponsoring in Hungary this October that will bring together political, academic and religious leadership to address this matter. In analyzing this resurgence of anti-Semitism in Europe, there seem to be a several direct sources, different but, but related sources that are flowing together to create a very troubling current. The first we might call traditional European anti-Semitism. Its source is found in the majority population, and I want to be very clear that I'm not saying that its source is found in the majority of the population, but in the majority population of European nations. And this includes sort of the traditional marginalization and targeting of Jews as being apart from and other and outside the community of the nation. This version of the pathology involves racism, suspicion, sometimes religious hatred, and can be seen perhaps most vividly in the emergence of these far-right parties and political movements, such as the Jobbik Party in Hungary, the Golden Dawn Party in Greece, and I know, Christina, you mentioned that in Sweden as well, there has been one of these sort of very xenophobic far-right parties that is now represented in your parliament. The second strain of virulent and frequently very violent anti-Semitism comes from a different source. It is rooted in the relatively new and rapidly growing Muslim minority communities in various European countries. Now again, by no means does this violent anti-Semitism represent everyone within those communities, but we also cannot ignore the simple factual reality that a huge amount of very, very violent and dangerous anti-Semitism is generated within some of these struggling and often themselves marginalized uh, minority and sometimes recent immigrant communities. France in particular has struggled with some shocking incidents of terrorism, violence, and murder directed against Jewish schools, temples, and individuals, much of it stemming from the French Muslim community. Finally, we see throughout Europe and elsewhere a phenomenon that has been called the new anti-Semitism. And this is perhaps the most widespread and pernicious manifestation of hostility. The new anti-Semitism masquerades as entirely legitimate and appropriate criticism of the state of Israel, the only Jewish state in the world. Now Israel, like every other country, can and should face sincere criticism over policies when warranted. In that regard, it is no different from and shouldn't be treated any differently than any other country. However, there are three clear markers that can help identify when legitimate criticism of the Jewish state is actually morphing into a manifestation of an insidious form of this new anti-Semitism. And let me tell you what those three markers are. It's something I would encourage you to sort of get your antenna attuned to. The first is demonization. When criticism of the government of Israel is used to demonize the entire country with absurd and offensive and overtly evil characterizations, that is one of the first warning flags to watch for. So again, when you hear criticism of a policy, it may relate to something having to do with Gaza or the Palestinian community. And when it begins to morph into accusations of, of Nazism and genocide and Hitler-type tactics, the flag should go up. We've crossed over the territory. This isn't legitimate policy disagreement. This isn't discussion of the best way to move forward on a peace process. This is something else. The second marker or warning flag to look for is delegitimization itself. That is the effort to call into question the very right of the state of Israel to exist. Many countries, our own included, engage in practices and policies and, and overseas engagements that can be troubling and, and uh, you know, legitimately subject to sometimes even withering criticism. And yet we never hear it asked, does America have the right to exist? Does Sweden have the right to exist? Does France? Does Germany? Does Egypt? Does Sudan? 
pick any country, any country on the face of the earth, and I challenge you to show me the occasion in which any legitimate public individual says they don't have the right to exist. And yet, Israel alone, among all the nations of the world, the only Jewish state in the world, is frequently subject to precisely those sorts of questions being raised. Purveyors of this new and, as I say, insidious form of anti-Semitism often question the appropriateness and the desirability of the existence of the Jewish state. So there is your second marker, demonization and delegitimization. And the third would be the invocation of double standards. Is the state of Israel being held to an absurd double standard of conduct that is applied to no other country and not to any of its neighbors in the part of the world that it, it lives in? Um, once again, when you see that third marker, you know that what you are witnessing is not part of the public discussion and dialogue, but you are witnessing a manifestation of the new form of anti-Semitism. Sadly, this new anti-Semitism is both widespread and it is too infrequently called out and condemned for what it truly is. But of course, Europe is neither the only nor the worst region of the world when it comes to anti-Semitism. The Middle East remains the epicenter of a deep and truly pathological hatred of the Jewish people. A 2010 Pew Research study showed almost comically high levels of anti-Semitic attitudes in the majority Muslim countries it surveyed. And yes, you actually heard me correctly when I said comically high. According to this Pew survey, these attitudes of, of deeply entrenched anti-Semitism ranged from 99% to 100%. So in the countries surveyed, it was almost impossible to find people who didn't hold these very destructive attitudes. These are actual statistical results from the highly respected Pew Research Foundation. I'd like to share with you a recent experience I had in Egypt that speaks to, to this problem and what a, what a deep-seated one it is. Um, it was not mentioned, but one of the professional hats that I wear at the moment is that I serve as chair of the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. And uh, earlier this year, I led a youth surf delegation, that's our acronym, to Egypt. Um, and obviously there have been a lot of recent developments in Egypt, so it's a very fluid and chaotic situation and none of us really know um, what, what directions things will be going in. But during this visit, I had the opportunity to meet with um, a gentleman who at that time was a deputy prime minister and was reputed to be particularly close to President, now deposed President Morsi. And some of you may recall that not too long ago, um, some relatively recent comments of President Morsi were unearthed in which he was speaking to a group of people and instructed them that we must nurse our children and our grandchildren on the hatred of the Jews down to the last generation. Well, I was in this meeting, sitting as far from this very close advisor to President Morsi as, as you and I are sitting, so not very far apart at all. And uh, we had a translator there for our discussion, although it became quite clear to me that he actually spoke English because when I said to him what I'm about to share with you, the expression on his face indicated to me he understood before his translator had uh, translated it into Egyptian. And we had talked about a variety of things, our concerns about the new Egyptian constitution, and it proved that our concerns were quite well founded because that's one of the reasons why the um, Morsi government was recently deposed. And, and we had talked about a number of other matters, but I felt very strongly, I suppose you could also almost say I felt like my father was sort of perched on my shoulder, um, whispering in my ear, because I felt very strongly impressed that I should um, raise this issue of the endemic anti-Semitism in Egyptian society. And so I said to him, I said, you know, your president is uh, reported as having said to the Egyptian people that they need to raise their children and grandchildren on the hatred of Jews down to the last generation. I said, I am a Jew. I am the daughter of 
Jewish Holocaust survivors. And so when your president says that to his people, he is saying to them that they need to nurse in their children the hatred of me and my seven children and my two grandchildren down to the last generation. I said, this is not the speech, this is not the conduct, this is not the behavior of a civilized society. This is a stain, a terrible stain on the character of Egypt. This is a shame on the character of your nation. This is appalling that in 2013, 2012, that such language and discourse should still be permitted and engaged in by the leaders of your country. It was very, very quiet in the room. You could hear a pin drop. And we just looked at each other. And then I pivoted and I said, what if your president were next week at Friday prayers to speak to the crowds that gather in front of your magnificent mosques and stand up and say, no more, enough. You will not hear from me. You will not hear from the legitimate leaders of this country such bile and such venom and such hatred directed at our cousins, the Jews. We have plenty of things to disagree with and to be upset about, and we can argue and fight with our neighbor Israel, and we can raise important problems that we see. But this evil of anti-Semitism, it is time to root it out from the bosom of our nation. Well, I should mention that the, the gentleman we were meeting with was a Salafist, and so even more conservative than the Muslim Brotherhood party from which uh, President Morsi hails. And he didn't really respond. He was clearly extremely uncomfortable and basically said, Israel's bad, Israel's evil, and we moved on. The next day I was meeting with a group of women's rights activists who were really agitated at the time because there were a lot of very problematic things going on in Egyptian society from their perspective. And I shared this encounter. And I, I left out a, a part of it because when I had spoken to the minister, I said, you know, if your president had the courage to do that, the very next day, really within hours, the accolades would rightly pour in from around the world because he would have done something so courageous. And he would have taken a risk to put his country on a very different moral trajectory. So I shared this story, ending as I had when I had made the point to the minister with this hopeful pivot, you know, what, what it would do to change the, the dialogue and the discussion, not only in Egypt, but in the billion plus Muslim world globally. And the woman with whom we were meeting said, yes, the day after Mr. Morsi would deliver a speech like that, the accolades would indeed justly pour in. But the day after, the day after, he would be killed by his own people for such heresy. And that was a sobering moment, and I found myself somewhat speechless because, of course, I knew that she was probably right. Needless to say, these are sobering and terrible stories, and these are troubling trends we are talking about today. We are at an interesting moment in history where most of the eyewitnesses of the Holocaust are passing from the scene. And as the memory of these events grows more remote, the need for education and vigilance becomes even more urgent. The education that is needed, in my view, is much more, much, much more than making sure that the new generation knows about the historical events that occurred. You know, you'll teach them about a lot of things, the Civil War, the Peloponnesian Wars. It can seem somewhat remote, and that is a very, very great danger. The education that I think is vitally important is education that inculcates in them the moral and ethical values that will equip them to stand up against the evils they will surely have to confront. 
you know, I'm going to take a very short walk down memory lane to many years ago when I was a young lawyer uh, and had just started working on Capitol Hill. And um, there was a guy who wanted to take me out on a date. And thanks to him, I was on the receiving end of the most creative pickup line that ever came my way. Um, he asked me the following question. He said, imagine that tonight when you go back to your apartment and getting ready for bed and suddenly your room begins to fill with light and gets more and more and more illuminated and when it's just completely engulfed in brightness, you hear the voice of God. And that voice says to you, Katrina, I will answer any one question that you have. So ponder carefully what you want to ask me. And the idea was that I'd think about what I was going to ask God, and then I'd tell him when we went out on our date. So it's a pretty clever line, and if any of you are still out there in the dating market, I actually, you know, you may want to tuck that one back away, you know, because it was pretty, pretty provocative. I have to say, maybe it, wasn't, it was provocative, but maybe not effective, because I didn't actually go out with him. But, um, <laughs> but I thought about his question. <laughs> And I actually spent a long time contemplating it. And of course, you know, the first thoughts that popped into my mind were, you know, how do we end world poverty? How do we bring about lasting world peace? And sort of those big things that are on all of our wish list and to-do list. And I ultimately decided that it wasn't actually that we didn't know how to do those things. It was that somehow we lacked the will. And I did not want to squander my precious question in getting an answer that maybe I already knew. So in my mind, I ultimately opted for a very personal question. I decided that what I would ask God if I had that opportunity was the following. What will be the greatest moral challenge of my life and will I be equal to it? Will I be equal to it? I think looking back to the Holocaust, we can probably agree that collectively, humanity failed to meet the great moral crisis of its time. As a world, we were not equal to it. And so I think the question that has brought you as educators here to the Jan Karski Institute for this wonderful week of instruction and reflection and discussion and exploration is how can we equip the next generation to meet the great moral test of their time? In looking for some answers, I would like to, as the third speaker today, also call forth the memory, memory of Raoul Wallenberg, the Swedish hero who my mother has already spoken about and who Christina spoke about so beautifully. What were the qualities that he and the other rescuers and the other heroes, people like Jan Karski, um, what in Israel they refer to as the righteous among the nations, what were the qualities they had that empowered them to resist the evil of their day? It's a profound question. Um, and I know there are probably many, many answers and maybe none of them are adequate. But let me offer a few for your consideration. One quality I think they had is that they possessed the essential gift of empathy. The ability to feel with and identify with and have sympathy for other human beings with whom you may share very little in common. And we often think of Raoul Wallenberg in that context. You mentioned that he had other choices. He was the son of a wealthy and powerful family in Sweden. He could have lived out those terrible years in the safety and security of neutral Sweden. He was a Lutheran. He had nothing in common with the persecuted, abandoned Jews of Hungary. And yet he had this quality of empathy that instead of seeing the differences, instead of saying, they're not my people, they're not my country, they're not my race, they're not my faith, they're not my family, he saw what they shared in common. And that empathy impelled him and emboldened him to act, even though it posed great danger to himself. A second quality that I think many of those who stand up and are ready to be counted when, when it really is hard to do so, is that they have the ability to look just a little 
further down the road and understand that if evil is ignored and allowed to grow, it will eventually find its way to your door. It may not be at your door right now, but it will eventually find its way to you. I think this insight was perhaps most powerfully expressed in the famous prayer um, that was written by Martin Niemuller, uh, a German pastor who was eventually imprisoned during the Second World War by the Nazis for his opposition to Hitler and his regime. And I'm going to read it to you. Many of you will have heard it. But it expresses this idea of looking a little further down the road and understanding that to stand in solidarity with those who are persecuted is not only a, a noble act, but ultimately one that seeks your own defense and protection. He wrote, first they came for the communists, and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the socialists, and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for the Catholics, and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a Catholic. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. Finally, and this is really important, and again, hard to think about and hard to remember in the somewhat idyllic setting in which we find ourselves today, but I think that these individuals knew that as precious as life is, there is more to life than life. And what gives meaning and purpose to our existence are the moral principles and convictions for which we are prepared to sacrifice everything, if need be. And so as you go forward and return to your schools and to your communities as educators, ready to bring historical lessons, but also moral lessons about the Holocaust and the lessons of the Holocaust to your students, I hope you will think about those those three qualities that I believe the, the heroes of, of the Holocaust shared in common and that gave them that determination and that courage, really, to do things that we now stand and marvel at. I'd like to close today um, with a, a rabbi story. Um, as the daughter of two uh, proud Jewish Holocaust survivors, I feel like I could do no less. And this was one of my father's favorite. A rabbi calls his students to him and poses the following question. He says, I'd like you to tell me how it is you can know the precise moment at which the night has turned to day. Well, one of the students says, Rabbi, is it when a man walking back to his home through the village at night can distinguish the roof of his little hovel from that of his neighbor's hovel, even if he's had a bit too much to drink. The rabbi said, no, no, that's not the answer. Well, another student said, ah, Rabbi, I know. It's when a man walking through the forest at night can distinguish between the shape of a wolf and a dog coming toward him through the woods. The rabbi said, no, no, that's not right either. And then he turned to his students and said, the way you can know the precise moment at which the night has turned to day is when a man walking down the street sees a stranger walking towards him and recognizes in the face of that stranger his brother. Let's all be about the business and the work of bringing that moment to pass when the night has turned to day. Thank you very much.